Roman 34th English Sermon Manuscript. Today we will make an observation of Romans chapter 15 verses 1 to 33 and RSB and NEB. Let's read Roman chapter 15 verses 1 through 6 and RSB. We who are strong ought to put up with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us must please our neighbor for the good purpose of building up the neighbor. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written in Psalm chapter 69 verses 9, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, Dida Scalia, the act of teaching, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another, in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you, the Jews and the Gentiles, may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The followings are Roman chapter 15 verses 1 to 6 and E.B. translation. Those of us who have a robust conscience must accept as our own burden the tender scruples of weaker man and not consider ourselves. Each of us must consider his neighbor and think what is for his good and will build up the common life. For Christ, too, did not consider himself, but might have said in the words of Scripture, the reproaches of those who reproached thee felt upon me. For all the ancient scriptures were written for our own instruction, in order that through the encouragement they give us, we may maintain our hope with fortitude. And may God, the source of all fortitude and all encouragement, grant that you may agree with one another after the manner of Christ Jesus, so that with one mind and one voice you may praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's read Romans chapter 15 verses 7 to 13 in our SB. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God in order that he might confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will confess to you among the Gentiles, and sing praises to your name. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the people praise him. And again Isaiah says, the root of Isa shall come, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles, in him the Gentiles shall hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The followings are Roman chapter 15, Verses 7 to 13, NEB translation. In a word, accept one another as Christ accepted us to the glory of God. I mean that Christ became a servant of the Jewish people to maintain the truth of God by making good his promises to the patriarchs and at the same time to give the Gentiles cause to glorify God for his mercy. As scripture says, therefore, I will praise thee among the Gentiles and sing hymns 
to thy name. And again, Gentiles make mercy together with his own people. And yet again, all Gentiles praise the Lord. Let all people praise him. Once again, Isaiah says, There shall be the Zion of Isa, the one raised up to govern the Gentiles. On him the Gentiles shall set their hope. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace by your faith in him until by the power of the Holy Spirit you overflow with hope. Christon diakonon gegene stai peritomes hyper aletheias deu. In English, for the truth of God, Christ has become a servant of circumcised, which means Jesus Christ was circumcised, as in Luke chapter 2, verse 21, NRSB. After eight days had passed, it was time to circumcise the child, and he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. There were two different genealogical tables in the gospel, one at Matthew, the other one at Luke. David was the seventh son of Isaac, and David had ten sons from his wives and nine sons from his concubines. Solomon was the seventh, and Nathan was the tenth son of David from the same mother, Bathsheba. According to Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 through 17, Solomon is forefather of Joseph, who was the family genealogical father of Jesus. And according to Luke chapter 3, verses 23 to 38, Nadan was forefather of Maria, who was biological mother of Jesus. Either biologically or family genealogically, Jesus is a descendant of Isa. Paul said that Jesus rose to rule the Gentiles to hope. The God of hope may fill the Gentiles with all joy and peace in believing. Let's read Romans chapter 15, verses 14 to 21 in our SB. I myself feel confident about you, my brothers and sisters, that you yourself are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Nevertheless, on some points I have written to you rather boldly by way of reminder. Because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to boast of my work for God, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to win obedience from the Gentiles by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and as far around as Illyricum I have fully proclaimed the good news of Christ. Thus I make it my ambition to proclaim the good news, not where Christ has already been named, so that I do not build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him shall see, and those who have never heard of him shall understand. The followings are Roman chapter 15, verses 14 to 21, NAB translation. My friends, I have no doubt in my own mind that you yourselves are quite full of goodness and equipped with knowledge of every kind well able to give advice to one another. Nevertheless, I have written to refresh your memory and written somewhat 
boldly at times in virtue of the gift I have from God. His grace has made me a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. My priestly service is the preaching of the gospel of God, and it falls to me to offer the Gentiles to him as an acceptable sacrifice consecrated by the Holy Spirit. Thus, in the fellowship of Christ Jesus, I have ground for pride in the service of God. I will venture to speak of those things alone in which I have been Christ's instrument to bring the Gentiles into his allegiance by word and deed, by the force of miraculous signs, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. As a result, I have completed the preaching of the gospel of Christ from Jerusalem as far round as Illyricum. It is my ambition to bring the gospel to places where the very name of Christ has not been heard, for I do not want to build on another man's foundation, but as scriptures says, they who had not news of him shall see, and they who never hold of him shall understand. Let's read Roman chapter 15 verses 22 to 29 and are as we. This is the reason that I have so often been hindered from coming to you, but now with no further place for me in these regions, I desire, as I have for many years, to come to you when I go to Spain, for I do hope to see you on my journey, and to be sent on by you once I have enjoyed your company for a little while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem in a ministry to the saints, for Macedonia and Agaia have been pleased to share their resources with the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. They were pleased to do this, and indeed they owe it to them, for if the Gentiles have come to share in the spiritual blessings, they ought also to be observed to them in material things. So when I have completed this, and have delivered to them what has been collected. I will set out my way of you to Spain, and I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. The followings are Roman chapter 15, verses 22 to 29, NEB translation. That is why I have been prevented all this time from coming to you. But now I have no further scope in this part, and I have been longing for many years to visit you on my way to Spain, for I hope to see you as I travel through, and to be sent there with your support after having enjoyed your company for a while. But at the moment, I am on my way to Jerusalem on an errand of God's people there, for Macedonia and Agaia have resolved to raise a common fund for the benefit of the poor among God's people at Jerusalem. They have resolved to do so, and indeed they are under an obligation to them for if the Jewish Christians shared their spiritual treasures with the Gentiles, the Gentiles have a clear duty to contribute to their material needs. So, when I have finished this business and delivered the proceeds under my own seal, I shall set out for Spain by way of your city. And I am sure that when I arrive, I shall come to you with the full measure of the blessing of Christ. What did happen in Jerusalem, actually? Paul arrived at the Jerusalem safely and met 
with James and all the elders in Jerusalem Christian Church. It was written in Acts chapter 21, verses 17 to 24 NRSV. When we arrived in Jerusalem, the brothers welcomed us warmly. The next day, Paul went with us to visit James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard it, they praised God. Then they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands of believers there are among the Jews? and they are all jealous for the law. They have been told about you that you teach all the Jews living among the Gentiles to forsake Moses and that you tell them not to circumcise their children or observe the customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. So do what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Join this man, go through the rite of purification with them, and pay for the shaving of their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself observe and guard the law. Then James and elders asked Paul to step out in the temple where all the Jews gather at any time. Misunderstanding caused by an idle rumor should be adjusted by authorized person rather than the person himself misunderstood. At the Jerusalem church, the authorized person who could justify Paul's activities in such a rumor was James. But James did not collect the congregation members to explain the rumors about what Paul did for the Gentiles, but instead pushed Paul out at the temple, where not only Jerusalem Christian, but also the Jews all over the world gather at any time. James did not protect Paul and his ministry in the Gentiles. What is the circumcision? It was ordered by the God of Abraham, as described in Genesis chapter 17, verse 9 to 14, NRSV. As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring, after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall circumcise the flesh of your four skins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you throughout your generation. Every male among you shall be circumcised when he is eight days old, including the slave born in your house and the one bought with your money from any foreigner. who is not of your offspring. Both the slave born in your house and the one bought with your money must be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. The Gentiles who was proselyted as a Judaist were not slaves or bought by the Jews with their money. Therefore, they could not be an offspring of Abram by circumcision. Therefore, proselyted Gentiles had no obligation to be circumcised as a Judaist. Paul strongly mentioned about the relationship in 4 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 17 to 19, NRSV. However, that may be, let each of you lead the life that the Lord has assigned, to which God called you. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? 
let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But obeying the commandments of God is everything. For an offspring of Abram, the circumcision is very important to be a people of God in this world, and to him obeying the commandments of God is also important. But the proselyted Gentiles, circumcision is not effective in belonging to the people of God in this world. But obeying the commandments of God would lead him to be a people of God in this world. Let's read Romans chapter 15, verses 30 to 33 and r s b I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in earnest prayer to God on my behalf, that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my ministry to Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. The God of peace be with all of you. Amen. The following are Romans chapter 15, verses 30 to 33, NAB translation. I implore you by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love that Spirit inspires, be my allies in the fight. Pray to God for me that I may be saved from unbelievers in Judea and that my errand to Jerusalem may find acceptance with God's people, so that by His will I may come to you in a happy frame of mind and enjoy a time of rest with you. The God of peace be with you all. Amen. In the temple, when the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia stirred up the whole crowd. Then all the city was aroused, and they seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple. While they were trying to kill Paul, the Roman tribune of the cohort took soldiers and centurions, ran down to them, and protected him from the crowd. Paul appealed Festus to be kept in custody for the decision of his imperial majesty. After two years and two months in the prison of Caesarea, Paul traveled to Rome by sea at Roman military expense for almost six months because of bad weather, by God's will, not by Paul's will. In Rome, Paul stayed as described in Acts chapter 28, verse 30 to 31, NRSB. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Paul wanted to visit the Roman Christian congregation to say hello, and there he wanted to take a trip to Spain by the help of the Roman Christians. But the God let Paul stay in a house to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to the great number of Jews, not Roman Christians, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus Christ, both from the laws of Moses and from the prophet. Therefore, the following are the title of this sermon. How Paul was traveled to Rome and proclaimed the kingdom of God. 